Nationalists in many places often blame outside countries, whether the United States, Europe, or someone, as the ultimate cause for whatever problems a particular country faces. These claims are often exaggerated, but in the case of Haiti, they are spot on. To find out why, join me for a brief explainer on Haitian history and politics. The area now known as Haiti was originally colonized by the Spanish, along with the rest of the island of Hispaniola. But after constant pirate attacks, the Spanish crown ordered its population to the camp entirely for the eastern part of the island, and soon what had been a small pirate French outpost became an official French colony. And not just any colony, but the richest in the planet, Saint-Domingue. Most of that wealth depended on a single cash crop, sugar, and more importantly, on the labor that made that possible, enslaved people. During the 15th century, the Spanish enslaved the local Taino population, but brutal abuse and European diseases quickly wiped them out. By the time the French officially took over the western part of the island in 1697, the practice of enslaving Africans and using them as the main labor force was firmly established in the Americas. The French embraced it with gusto for Saint-Domingue. The system was brutal in its application, a nightmare for any of the Africans kidnapped. First, they had to endure a trip across the Atlantic below the deck of a ship with little food and chained so tightly they could barely move. Even worse, with a route that had roughly a 15% death rate, one was practically guaranteed to spend months next to corpses. Survival only meant a future lifetime of back-breaking labor, of constant humiliations and little hope. In turn, this system gave way to a deeply stratified society with four major groups. The first were Les Grands Blancs, or Big Whites, the owners of plantations who were for the most part absentee landlords and whose main goal was to make as much money as possible and to seldom have to visit Saint-Domingue. After all, the island was full of tropical diseases and lacked the type of excitement and entertainment that living in France provided. The second group were Les Petits Blancs, or Small Whites. These were all the other whites in the island the people that actually ran the plantations, the administrators, and the people in charge of the merchant houses. The third group were what the people at the time called sang mele or gens de couleur libre, that is, mixed people or free people of color. These were individuals of mixed race who had been the result of interbreeding, often violent, between whites and slave Africans and their descendants. These people were free and sometimes even owned property, including kidnapped Africans. Finally, there were the enslaved blacks. Their condition was much worse than you can possibly imagine. It was not simply that they were forced to work against their will in backbreaking work, but that they also faced all kinds of abuses, including torture and death. Conditions were so bad that an enslaved person had a 50% chance of dying after three years in the colony. Malnutrition, abuse, and work accidents saw to that. Again, this was not a coincidence. It was not that the enslavers tried to take care of their property but simply couldn't. Instead, it was that given the immense profits they could make, they saw the debts of the Africans and their replacement simply as the cost of doing business. The goal was simply to try and work them as hard as possible for as long as possible and then replace them when needed. The demand was so massive that historians estimate that about 10% of the total number of enslaved Africans in the Atlantic trade ended up in the Saint-Domingue colony. On top of this hierarchical and highly stratified society, there was also deep numerical inequality. In 1789, there were 30,000 whites, combined big and small, 28,000 people of color, and 465,000 blacks, most of whom had been born in Africa. Historians estimate as many as 70% of them or two-thirds of the colonial population had been born there. With whites being outnumbered 15 to 1, the fear of slave revolts was constant. They had good reason to worry. It was only a matter of time before they faced the largest one ever recorded. The spark came from another revolution, the French one. At first, a social upheaval convulsed the metropole and the Declaration of the Rights of Man was published and distributed in the colony Tension surfaced not between the enslaved and the rest of the population, but among the whites and the free people of color. The big whites had always shaved under the French government's restrictions, particularly regarding free trade and those under the Code Noir, 
the legal structure that was supposed to prevent the worst slave abuses and give free people of color the exact same rights as any other French subject. In fact, since 1758, the big whites had been busy chipping away at the code with the aim of setting up a permanent white supremacist society. Thus, when in 1791, the revolutionary authorities in France declared that the free people of color in Saint-Domingue were French citizens, the big and little whites began to seriously consider independence while ignoring the decree. This naturally incensed the jeunes de couleur, who opted to rebel. As the whites were busy putting down insurgencies by the free people of color, the enslaved Africans realized this was the opportunity they had been waiting for. On the night of August 14, 1791, thousands of enslaved Africans came together at Bois Caima, a clearing in the forest southwest of the colony's capital, Le Cap. They had a voodoo ceremony, said a prayer led by Dottie Bookman, and prepared themselves for revolution. A week later, on August 22nd, the fury that had been contained for decades exploded and enslaved the Africans promptly set to slaughter everyone that had oppressed them for so long. Shortly, the rebel numbers grew from 1,000 to 20,000, and within three days, the most profitable estates in the north, 184 sugar plantations and 1,000 coffee farms were destroyed, as the rebels made it a point to set fires to the sugar cane and the equipment in the plantations. Armed with machetes, swords, and a few guns, they attempted to take over Le Cap, but failed as the colonists were well fortified and better armed. Even worse, their main leaders, like Dottie Bookman, were soon killed, and after a few months, the uprising settled into a stalemate with the colonists. As the rebellion continued, the insurgents had to contend with many problems, the most immediate of which was how to feed themselves. Lacking a long-term strategy, their situation became desperate enough that the leaders actually tried to negotiate peace and proposed a reinstitution of slavery with only a few conditions. That a few of them be freed, that the whip be banned, and the rest of the rebels get an extra day off. Somehow, even this, the whites rejected, proving to the rebels that the only choices were slavery or a fight to the death. What the insurgency really needed was an astute leader that could give it discipline, a long-term strategy, and military acumen. And they got it, in Toussaint Leverture. Toussaint had been born a slave who had had the unusual fortune of receiving an education and could not only read and write, but was familiar with some classical writers as well as French philosophers. He had been freed in his thirties and worked as a coachman for a plantation. As such, he interacted with the various social strata and was respected by all. Although he did not participate in the early stages of the revolution, he began to rise in the ranks in 1792, and by 1794 he was the most prominent revolutionary leader with control over large swaths of the country. Meanwhile, even as the revolutionary government in France officially abolished slavery in 1794, the rebels had to constantly defend their liberty not just against French colonists, but also the Spanish and later the British who invaded Saint-Domingue in 1793 at the invitation of the Big Whites who saw it as a quick way to regain control of the situation. Toussaint neutralized them militarily one by one, including divisions within his own ranks, and then prepared himself for one final showdown with the French. This was the Clerk Expedition an invading armada sent by Napoleon in 1801, which intended to turn back the clock and regain French control over the island. The massive force was successful at first, but little by little, the military cunning of the rebels and tropical diseases decimated the French army, leading to their final defeat at the Battle of Vertier in 1803. Independence was at hand, but Toussaint would not be there to enjoy it. The French had managed to arrest him in 1802 and immediately sent him to a French prison where he died less than a year later. The job to lead Saint-Domingue fell to one of Louverture's generals, Jean-Jacques de Salines, who after winning the Battle of Vertier set out to create a new nation. He declared himself the leader of an independent Haiti, the Taino name for the island, and then promptly set out to kill every white French person left in the former colony. This systematic slaughtering was seen from de Salines' perspective not just as revenge, but as the only way to ensure that there would be no future betrayals from that class. It was a huge mistake.
Many atrocities had been committed on both sides since the revolution began, on top of the horrendous practice of slavery itself. But this one stands out because not only was it clearly unnecessary, but it gained Haiti the enmity of the French state and fed the propaganda of white supremacy for centuries, which in turn Haiti would pay dearly for. But that was still in the future. In the meantime, Dessalines faced the daunting task of rebuilding Haiti. The main question he faced here, as Louverture had before him, was how to rebuild a labor-intensive cash crop economy without slavery and much lower interest from potential export markets, while at the same time maintaining a large army as a deterrent to foreign powers. What Haitian leaders opted for, starting with Toussaint, was to force people back to work on their plantations, not as slaves, but as laborers. The change was an improvement on the conditions from the horrors of slavery, but certainly far from what those at Boy Caima might have dreamt. And the only way to maintain that type of order over a reluctant population was a type of authoritarianism that would plague Haiti well into the 21st century. The Saline, for instance, promptly declared himself emperor and only two years later would be killed by his lieutenants. Of the 22 presidents who served between 1843 in 1915, only one finished his term in office, six were either killed or died in office, and one resigned. The 14 others were overthrown. And out of the 22, three declared themselves monarchs and two presidents for life. Even worse, one of them, Jean-Pierre Boyer, agreed in 1825 to pay 150 million francs to France, later reduced to 90 million as an indemnity to the French. This was not just insulting, as it meant Haitians were paying the French for a freedom they had already won, but it was an absolutely crushing economic blow. The state had little income with which to pay, but Boyer, no doubt, thought that with the French recognition, other countries would follow suit, creating new markets for Haiti and turbocharging its economy. Unfortunately, the investment did not pay off. Large parts of the Haitian economy had already been transformed to subsistence agriculture, so there was little to export, and even that little could not be efficiently transported to the largest potential market, the United States. That was because the Americans didn't even recognize the country until 1862. Southern slave owners had dominated American politics during that period, and the idea of recognizing a country that had come about as a result of revolt of the enslaved was something they could not countenance. Haiti had to be made an example of. Thus, the little income the Haitian state could muster went for decades to pay for the debt and then the interest on the interest of the debt, and to pay the military as Haitian leaders either fought themselves or tried to amass a defensive force to keep themselves in power. In fact, the Haitians did not finish paying off the French debt until 1947. As it happens, the debt would also pave the way for Haitians to lose the one thing they had gained, their independence. In 1915, Haiti was experiencing yet another bout of political turmoil, this time with the potential emergence of a ruler who would be counter to American economic interests. Faced with the possibility that Haiti might stop paying the French and American debts and worry that other countries like Germany might take advantage of the situation, the Americans decided to invade and occupy the island. In July of that year, Woodrow Wilson sent the Marines to occupy Port-au-Prince. They would not leave for nearly 20 years. In the meantime, they seized the Haitian National Bank, key institutions like customs houses, installed presidents, and a new constitution favorable to U.S. interests. To the extent the occupation left anything of value for the island, it was infrastructure projects like bridges, roads, and canals, but even this was with forced labor. That, coupled with the rampant racism that the officers and commanders displayed, made them quite unpopular with the Haitians, which in turn led to two major insurgencies, but both were brutally put down. In 1934, after considering that the occupation was not worth it, FDR finally ordered the American troops to return home. After the Americans left, not much changed politically. Haitian leaders continued to be authoritarian, suppressing all opposition and criticism. The one leader that enacted even a few minor social policies, like the first income tax and the expansion of the school system, Du Marseille Estimé, fell to a military coup in 1950. And even as bad as things had been throughout Haiti's sorry political history, life was about to be much worse with the arrival of one of the country's true monsters, 
François Papadoc Duvalier. Duvalier had a reputation as a humanitarian and a man of the people when he was first elected. He had been part of a program to eradicate tropical diseases, which is where he earned the nickname Papa Doc. Reality in office turned out to be quite different. First, he created a paramilitary force that answered only to him. The force then set out to systematically torture, disappear, and murder anyone that might oppose the regime. They were so fearsome that the populace named them the Tantan Maku, the name of a mythological Haitian boogeyman that carried children away in a sack, Maku in French, and ate them for breakfast. Risk went well beyond those who opposed the regime, though. Often it was random, precisely to keep Haitians in fear. And soon, the Tantan Maku became an extortionist force, preying on people and killing anyone that refused to pay or criticize them. Victims' bodies would be left to rot in public, to scare others, and if their relatives tried to take them away for a proper burial, they would be disappeared themselves. Meanwhile, Papa Doc rigged elections and declared himself president for life. He then used voodoo imagery to create a strange personality cult where he deliberately tried to convince the population that he was the incarnation of Baron Samadhi, one of the voodoo loas and the master of the dead. As his regime continued, the economy languished and those who could leave the island did so and mostly ended up in the United States. There were attempts to dislodge him. One of the most famous ones, June Haiti, attempted to recreate Castro's revolution in Cuba. But they faced a dramatic different geography. For one, they could not hide in the mountains as easily because of the vast deforestation that had been taking place since the revolution. And for another, the military in Tantan Makut were far more loyal to the dictator than the equivalent forces were to Batista. They were quickly annihilated, as were their families and much of the town that the would-be revolutionaries came from. Men, women, and children that had nothing to do with it other than being unlucky to have been from the same place. In the end, not only did Papa Doc stay in power, but he imposed his successor, his son, Baby Doc, who then proceeded to stay in power for another 15 years. Like father, like son, the regime changed only enough to revive tourism somewhat, but not much else. Finally, massive street uprisings deposed Baby Doc in 1986. The trauma and violence permanently damaged Haiti, and the country even now continues to deal with their legacy. But at least Haitians know the Duvaliers as a thing of the past. In the meantime, since 1986, the country has emerged in a protracted struggle for democracy, which has had its moments of hope. One such moment was in January 1991, when Jean-Bertrand Aristide won Haiti's first truly free and fair elections and set out to take the country in a more sustainable path. In particular, he sought to bring the military under civilian control, to initiate investigations into the Tantan Makut, and to freeze the bank accounts of any rich Haitians that tried to leave the country. These reforms angered the elite and was quickly ousted after only eight months in the job. 200 years after the Haitian Revolution, political stability and a capable, responsive government still seem like a pipe dream for its inhabitants. The coup did receive international condemnation, and the Clinton administration was persuaded to send American troops into the country in 1994 for a short period of time so as to return Aristide to finish his term. Once back in Haiti, the triumphant president abolished the military making Haiti one of the three countries in Latin America without a standing army. Unfortunately, Aristide also brought with him a taste for neoliberal economics and austerity within a country with massive poverty and little in the way of public goods. This made him and his successor, René Preval, one of his protégés, lose much of their original popularity. Even worse, the level of crime continued to rise as criminal gangs, the legacy of the Tonton Macute, terrorized the country. So when Aristide returned for a second presidential term, he was ousted once again, but this time he claimed in collaboration between those gangs and the United States. Whether the U.S. was actually behind the coup is contested, but one thing is absolutely clear. The ousting of Aristide showed just how weak Haitian institutions continue to be and how fragile their democracy is. The situation was bad enough that the United Nations sent a peacekeeping mission in an effort to stabilize the country officially known as MINUSTA. They remained in the country between 2004 and 2017, but their legacy was a tainted one. 
Not only did they bring cholera to the country, but it is clear that several of their members took advantage of their position and raped a number of children. And somewhat less clearly, some of the United Nations soldiers also engaged in human rights violations. For many Haitians today, the UN is just another set of foreigners in a long history that have taken advantage of Haiti. So the past decade has been one of huge challenges for the country, and although administrations throughout this period have not been as destructive as those of the Duvalier, the economy has been growing slowly but steadily, and the government has had some minimal improvements in infrastructure and other public goods, there remains a yawning gap between what they can do and what people need, which of course often leads to protests and political upheaval. Truth is that even in the best of circumstances and under the best of statesmen, government officials would have a hard time overcoming a legacy of political instability and foreign intervention. Haitians have been paying dearly for the sin of having dared to have had a successful slave revolt. Let us hope that dark legacy has been finally buried.